So we're moving right along in our unit four notes, the unit being on sensation and perception. And we just finished a few sets of notes that was strictly on sensation. And you could say that we talked a little bit about the perception with each of those sensations, but now we're moving into entirely perception. And remember that sensation is all of our sensory organs and what they take in from the external environment. So how our eyes take in light waves. Upon transduction, which in our eyes is in the retina, meaning transduction as the translation of external stimuli, like light waves, into a neural message that the brain understands. Upon transduction, everything from there on is perception. It's how our brain organizes and interprets the information. So this set of notes is going to be on perceptual organization and how we go about that. So we're going to look at some illusions throughout this set of notes, which is it's a good way to understand how perception is organized um, because they provide good examples of um, how they might, our perceptions might be faulty, okay? So it is as good to study faulty perception as other perceptual phenomena. And for instance, line A, B being over here on the left and line B, C here, they look, it looks like A, B is shorter if not the same length, right? Line A, B is actually longer than line B, C. So the way that we perceive this is that line AB is shorter, when in actuality it is longer. That's because of different cues that our brain's picking up and making us to perceive the line as shorter. The tall arch, the vertical dimension of the arch looks longer than the horizontal when they are actually equal. This arch is essentially as tall as it is wide, yet it looks taller, again, faulty perception. So when vision, so just kind of going backwards here, talking about organization of our perception, right? There's a few things we have to understand. When vision competes with other um, senses, vision usually wins. And this phenomenon is called visual capture, okay? And we humans commit this a lot. Um, but it's something good to understand as we talk about how we organize our perception. So how do we form meaningful perceptions from sensory information? Well, we organize it. And gestalt psychology, which we talked about way back in unit one, that's what helps us organize information into meaningful wholes. So remember, the whole is different from the sum of its parts. That's kind of the catchphrase of gestalt psychology. The whole is different from the sum of its parts. So the sum of its parts could be one thing, meaning we're we are sensing one thing but the whole that we perceive is different and therefore could be faulty. So just recognizing that your perceptions could be wrong is a good step forward in our understanding in psychology. Each one of these next few terms are gestalt principles, and yes, they're on the test, and yes, they're on the AP exam. Figure ground as a gestalt principle. So this is when we organize our visual field into the objects, which is the figure, that stand out from their surroundings, which is the ground. So for instance, if you look at me in the corner of your screen right now, you know that I am the figure and that this is the background, right? That's figure ground, a consult principle, very similar. These illusions make it very difficult for you to establish which is the figure and which is the ground. So is the vase the figure or are the two faces the figure and what's the background? And then do you see the people going up down the stairs or do you see the two sets of arrows here? It's kind of a, an illusion, right? Gestalt groupings, and we have four different principles here. Having discriminated a figure from ground, our perception needs to organize figures into meaningful form using grouping rules. So we have proximity, which in this, this example here, you see three, one, two, and three parallel lines. So you almost see like poles there rather than six different black lines because they are proximal, because they are close to each other. Similarity, you see a line of triangles, a line of circles, and a line of triangles because they are similar, right? Like just on like, let's say a basketball court, you see the red jerseys versus the blue jerseys. Because they are similar, you see them as a cohesive whole. Continuity, you see the continue, two continuous lines in this image rather than separate parts of like this shape and then this shape, right? You don't see the half circle shapes. You see the single up, um, straight line and then the waves. Connectedness, you see almost like three dumbbells here. You see the two dots with the 
the stick in the middle rather than a circle, line, circle, circle, line, circle, right? You see them as connected and therefore as one. Grouping in reality, usually grouping principles help us construct reality, but at times it can lead us astray. So if you look at this image, it's like a doghouse that this guy has built, right? Um, but in reality, it's just like this, there's holes. So there are actually holes in it, but our brain can fill in those holes for us. Interesting. Um, that, by the way, is known as closure. When our brain fills in the holes, that's closure. Another gestalt principle. Okay, let's talk about depth perception. Depth perception is our ability to judge distances, right? So Gibson and Walk in 1960 suggested that human infants, babies around the crawling age, which is about six to nine months, they have depth perception. Even newborn animals show depth perception. And the way that they show this is by doing the visual cliff. And oftentimes you will see this on the AP exam. So notice that they have like a raised surface here, kind of like a table. Um, and on the left-hand side, they have the pattern on the table. And then they have a sheet of glass. So the baby won't actually fall. But then they have this same pattern down on the floor. So it makes them see, it tries to fool them, right? It tries to fool the baby to think that this is all one layer. They don't know that the glass is there. And they put mommy over here to say, come on, baby, come to mommy. And they will see that at about this age, six, nine months, babies like this child will actually stop at the edge and notice, ooh, that one's far down there and I don't want to fall, so I'm going to stop. Okay, that's depth perception, and they prove that with the visual cliff. Monocular cues. So these are cues that allow us to judge distance. These are depth perception cues, and if they are monocular, it requires one eye, mono, monocular. Interposition. Interposition is, says that objects that block other objects tend to be perceived as closer. Okay, so for instance, if I hold up my hand right now, my hand is blocking part of my face. You see all of my hand, not all of my face. Therefore, which one is closer to you, my hand or my face? Well, duh, it's my hand. You're able to perceive that with only one eye according to interposition. But it's also the idea that if one thing is being blocked, we perceive it as farther away than the one thing that's not being blocked. Okay, so that could end up fooling us like in this illusion. Like, whoa, where'd the horse and the gal go? And like, what's in front of what with the trees? And whoa, this is confusing, right? Another monocular cue is linear perspective. Probably learn a lot about this one in art. So parallel lines, like railroad tracks, appear to converge with distance. The more the lines converge or come together, the greater their perceived difference, or I'm sorry, distance. So like in art, when you have your canvas and you're drawing the two parallel lines, if you don't make them come very close to each other, it, it doesn't cover as much ground or distance, right? But if they're really close to each other up at the top, like in this image, like, wow, that's really far away, right? Relative size. If two objects are similar in size, we perceive one that casts a smaller retinal image as farther away. Okay, so this is the ability to squish someone who's far away, right? Like, so if you see someone who's far away and you're, you hold up your fingers and you squish them, right? You know that your friend is not this big in actuality. You know that they are actually five foot something tall probably, right? So the idea is that the smaller someone is, if the more you're able to squish them, the farther away they appear. Relative height. We perceive objects in that are higher in our f visual field as farther away. So if something is higher up, we perceive that to be higher away, or um, I'm sorry, farther away. So right now, as I'm looking at my classroom, right, the um, the whiteboard is higher in my visual field than these tables right here. I can show you. Right. So those tables there are lower in the visual field than that whiteboard. Therefore the whiteboard is farther away because it's higher in the visual field. And that shows relative height. Texture gradient. So texture allows us to see depth and distance. So indistinct or fine texture, um, it signals increasing distance. 
Okay, so the bigger the texture, which appears in these like spheres here, right, the closer it, it tends to like pop out at us. So the finer indistinct texture, the smaller the texture, um, it, it appears to be farther away, like in these, co the color kind of contributes to it too, but we can't see that detail. All right, binocular cues, bi being two, right? We need two eyes to perceive depth with these two depth perception cues. Convergence, so we have two eyes, therefore it's a binocular cue. When they move inward toward the nose to see an object, and outward, right, they move more parallel to each other to see far away objects. An object is perceived as closer the more we have to turn our eyes inward. Okay, so, and this can, we can kind of have ourselves thrown off when we're like in a big city and we look at a building that we're standing like at the, the foot of, right? We look up and it's like, wow, that totally kind of gives you an, like vertigo because you have to look inward to see it but it actually is farther away from you because it's so ginormous and high up there, right? So the more they turn inward, the closer we perceive that object to be. Retinal disparity. To have disparity is to have a difference between our retinas, which means we have to have two if there's a difference between them, hence binocular cue. So we have two, two retinas, two eyes, and they're on different spots on our face, right? Therefore, they actually do pick up two different images at two different angles. So if I'm looking at my computer mouse here, my two eyes are picking up two different angles, okay? The greater the difference between the two images that I pick up, for instance, of my computer mouse, the closer the object appears to be, the closer we perceive the object to be. So the way that you can test this is doing the finger sausage. So try looking at your two fingers, half an inch apart, about five inches away from your face. Don't look at your fingers, look beyond your fingers and you will see this image here. It looks like the finger sausage, right? Another way to test this is find something that's, I don't know, 10-ish feet away from you. So I'm going to put it on the clock and I want you to cover one eye, okay? So cover one eye and put your finger on the clock. Now switch your hand and cover the other eye. Does your finger appear to have moved? Yes, right? It's no longer on the clock, for instance. For me, that's because of retinal disparity. The more difference there is, the closer we perceive the object to be. So perception of movement, so different from gestalt, different from depth perception. Let's talk about perception of movement. We have some vocab terms here. Stroboscopic motion is our tendency to perceive motion in a series of slightly different still images that are flashed rapidly in succession. So this is a flip book or even a movie, right? It's a ton of still images that are flashed so quickly and are so similar that we perceive movement. The phi phenomenon, this is when uh, lights flash at certain speed and they tend to present illusions of motion. So neon signs use this principle to create motion perception, like an arrow, right, that um, it appears to like move or like the Christmas lights set to music. If you have like a bunch of Christmas trees and it goes back and forth, it appears that like the tree is almost moving, right? All right, perceptual constancy, we have a, a few of these, like shape and size constancy. Perceiving objects as unchanging, even as illumination and retinal image change, we perceive them as unchanging. So perceptual constancies include constancies of shape and size. So for instance, this door, we know that as a door closes and opens, Although on our retinas, the image changes, we know that the door remains the same shape and the same size. We know that it's, you know, the rectangle and it's the same size, even though the retinal image has changed. So with size constancy, again, stable size perception amid changing size of the stimuli and that this car we see it's farther away. We know it's the same size though. Okay, another kind of illusion with size distance relationship is the moon illusion. The moon illusion states that as the moon is on the horizon, we appear the moon to be larger, okay, and farther away. 
okay? So we, we think that the moon is larger and farther away than when it is up in the night sky, um, it appears to be smaller and closer. So cues to the object's distances at the horizon make the moon behind them seem farther away than the moon in the night sky. Um, here's the reasoning behind it. It's the, obje the object's distances at the horizon. So when the moon is on the horizon, there's hills, there's trees, there's maybe even buildings that cause you to, that's interposition, right? A building or a hill or a tree is blocking part of the moon. If you're driving on your road, on a road, the linear perspective makes it appear to be farther away. Those distance cues make the moon appear to be larger and farther away. Uh, so this is the Ponzo illusion, the distant monster at the top right here um, and the red bar up top, they appear to be bigger because of distance cues, because of linear perspective, size constancy, all of those, when actually this monster is the same size as this monster. Check it out. Use your fingers. And this red bar is the same size as this red bar. It's because of all these cues we've been talking about. Size distance relationship, this is the Mueller liar illusion. Are these vertical lines the same length? Yes, yes they are. It's just we perceive them as different. Um, both girls in the room are of similar height. These two ladies are the same height. However, we perceive them as different heights as they stand in the two corners of the room. Entertainment Junction up in like Westchester Mason area has one of these rooms. It's pretty cool looking. Um, you actually are in it and see it live, not just in a picture. Like your mom and your sister are in two different corners and your mom looks itty bitty as your mom is like, or your sister is huge. It's kind of a kind of a cool illusion. It's called the Ames Room. Okay, so an Ames Room is designed to give size distance illusions. And this is kind of how it's, how it's built. Um, visual illusions, straight lines, or are they bowed? They're actually straight. And then stationary or movie, moving, every black dot that you hold your vision on, the um, circles around it stop moving. But as you look at the image overall, it moves, right? Oh, kind of scary. This is a spiral, right? No. How many people and faces do you see? Like a ton. Which line matches with C? Is it A or B? It's actually B, even though it looks like A. And then do you see the old woman or do you see the young lady? And then these are some art ones, which I find are so totally cool. These are actually drawn on flat surfaces, like on sidewalks. These are drawn on sidewalks. Like these artists really understand depth cues, right? They have got it down. So some really cool stuff on illusions and the, like, you know, this one on the left, that looks so cool. Like, oh, I'm gonna jump in the pool with this giant person and beach ball. But then that's what it actually looks like at a different angle. Really cool on perception and how we organize things to perceive our world and how it might be faulty.